growing up, this was your favorite film. You saw it first when you were 14. Yes. 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 Can you tell us about what the film is about, therefore what the opera is about, and kind of main themes and problematics that it raises? Absolutely. So, um, yes, I saw this film when I was 14 years old. Um, I remember seeing a like 30 second clip um, as part of the Golden Globe Awards that year, in which Bess, um, in our opera, played by Sydney, um, has a conversation with her paralyzed husband, who tells her that she should go off and have sexual relations with other men, and then come back to his bedside and tell him about them. And it just completely blew. I was 13 at that time. And I was just like, what? I grew up on a farm in northern Alberta, Canada. And that was just not the kind of narratives that were playing in my cinema or that were celebrated by my parents. So, <laughs> um, and so I sought this film out uh, because it just, it seemed like a perspective. And I, I growing up Catholic um, and uh, I'm, I'm gay. So there was this like amazing queerness about that, uh, that offer from, from Jan. Um, and so it just, it really ignited my imagination. So I, uh, I saw this film, uh, and it's about a Scottish woman living on the Isle of Skye who falls in love with a beautiful, beautiful Norwegian um, oil rigger, uh, and uh, they are given the authority to marry within the Calvinist church, and uh, they, they do, and he goes off to work um, immediately after because he only has a few days off to, to get married, uh, and it sets Bess off on a sort of tailspin. She has some sort of, um, there, there may be mental illness, maybe not. There's something that she's dealt with a lot of loss. Um, she's uh, grieved the loss of her, her father and her brother. Um, and so um, there's just something sort of um, uncalibrated and it's really sort of pushes her over the end, over the edge, sorry. She goes, uh, he goes off and after he's supposed to be away for a month, and she is told by her mother that she's to endure uh, and that everything will be okay. She has to behave like a, a decent human being, um, but she just can't handle it. She wants her husband back so badly that she prays to God to send him home. And he happens to be in an accident. And so she believes that her prayer to God has caused this accident and has sent her husband home in a paralyzed state and thus sets her on a spiritual journey um, where she is reckoning with all of the things. She's trying to be a good human and she's listening to all the advice from everybody in her life. The, the church elders, her mother, her husband, who's telling her that she needs to go and be free and, and have these, just live her life like normal and that she can't just be beholden to his bedside. And so it's, uh, that is really the crux. Um, she goes on a spiritual journey to try to save her husband's life. Uh, and it results in, in some pretty insane actions. Um, and you should come and see the opera because I don't want to give away too much more. Um, but that's the crux, yeah. That was great. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. So. It's really good. Thank you. Uh, Missy, you're, you wrote the music for this. Yes. Um, we heard just some of these themes. I want to kind of highlight them and, and I give them a name to them. So there's the intersection of religion and sexuality, misogyny and liberation, devotion and insanity, physical health and mental health, that which is traditional, that which is deeply unorthodox, moral questions, what does it mean to be a good person, what indeed does it mean to be good, uh, and psychological questions. Is there anything... <laughs> To add, let's just act one. <laughs> um, no, I, there's so much in that. The ones that, um, the main themes, there's so many themes that run through this um, story and this film and this opera. And um, it's a story that keeps on giving. I mean, I've lived with this story now for eight years, thinking about it nearly every day. And I'm still discovering new things in this story, new themes. Um, so I think the ones that we kept coming back to in the process of writing and, and up until this day in the rehearsal process are the themes of goodness, which came from Lars von Trier. He said he wanted to make a film about what it means to be a good person, where everyone in the film is doing what they feel is the most good and yet still terrible things happen. So how, how do we get from point A to point B? And that journey is so interesting. Um, I was also interested in, in uh, working, uh, creating a female character who had a very complex morality um, where we are rooting for her, we're rooting for her, but then she's doing things that we don't agree with. And then, so we feel this conflict as the audience. And that is, I, I love um, 
you know, creating works like that, where we come out of the theater with more questions than answers and where we're not sure maybe who the good guys or the bad guys are. Um, and so this film really uh, played into all of that. I, but I think beyond all of that was this idea that, um, you know, Bess, I keep gesturing to Sydney because she was, she was our Bess. <laughs> um, and Bess is a woman in an impossible situation. So as Roy said, you know, her, every, everyone around her is telling her what to do and they're all telling her different things. The line of acceptable behavior is so small and thin as to be non-existent. So she's always falling off of it in one direction or the other. And that was also very interesting and very familiar to me as a woman. And I think that's the story of all the women in my family, um, most of the women who I know. And um, I was really attracted to the idea of creating an operatic work that explored that. And so and maybe, so let's go to you, Sydney. <laughs> You've been gestured towards. Um, how, do, how, does, how does it feel living, living these questions every day and performing them on stage? Um, it's definitely the most intense piece that I've done. It's It's been intense to be back in rehearsal after a few years away from this piece um, and to be sort of living with all those emotions and themes and, and questions every day. And it, it really starts to get under your skin. And I think it has the same effect for the audience when they watch it. Um, it just has a, a really powerful effect because of the extremity of the situations. Um, so, yeah. Maybe as a way to bracket this first discussion, you might perform for us. Happy to. <laughs> and maybe we could just set up briefly what you're about to perform. <laughs> All at once, no. <laughs> she wrote it. So, <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> so the, uh, you're going to hear the prologue. This is the first bit of, of vocalizing that you, you hear in the entire show. And it is Bess uh, pleading to the the councilman of the church to let her marry this man. Um, his name is Jan, it's called. Um, and in the production, and in most of the productions we've had, this is a, one of a few productions that we've seen and it's really fascinating to see different directors and how they approach the work. Um, this is our biggest um, and our most widespreading uh, production. It's gone to, uh, it began in Scotland. We've taken it to Australia. And now we are here in Paris and uh, it's going to the States next. Uh, so we have a couple of presentations over there. Um, and so, uh, yes, this is a really, uh, this is sort of the introduction to the character and uh, her introduction to the councilman and the audience of uh, Jan, who will show up in about 10 minutes. When you go see the opera, he'll show up. <laughs> And I would just add to that that the um, there's not really a traditional overture to this opera, um, but there is a sort of fake overture, um, which you'll hear. And this was the really um, me setting the so Scottish scene. This is to me my interpretation of the Scottish landscape, which um, we visited um, Scotland before we wrote the piece, and I was struck by the extremes of that landscape. So it's these jutting rocks coming out of a very luscious meadow, and it was just a uh, you know that ends in a cliff and. Um, it was just a, a landscape of extremes. And I thought, oh, this is the way this opera will begin with this little 10 measure um, setting of the scene. Um, I, I, what I was so excited about hearing this in person is because as I said at the beginning, this is a look behind the scenes at the opera. So we saw that, but I'm so curious. Um, there's the behind the scenes too of the composition process, the writing process. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? You know, we often host authors here and we always get questions in the Q&A. What time do you get up in the morning? How many words do you write a day? It's so different. I mean, I imagine possibly the structure might be same in terms of how you structure your days, but what does the a stripped back version of collaboration and composition look like? Okay, so at the, uh, the uh, it all begins with the libretto. Um, well, it all begins with the composer and the librettist coming together and trying to figure out what story they want to tell together. And sometimes that takes uh, years. Sometimes it takes a day. I, I actually told Missy that I thought that she should consider writing Breaking the Waves, and she initially said no. Um, and then she watched the film, and uh, she said that it wouldn't let her go. And so um, after a while of, of conversations like that, but then getting the rights, we had to option the film, and that took us about a year uh, and then uh, I started writing the libretto. And so I had a full draft of the libretto done. And then we went to the Isle of Skye and we had this amazing opportunity to actually have Scottish 
uh, people. We would just meet people at um, coffee shops and uh, taxi drivers. And this woman, we stayed in an Airbnb, and she gave us, uh, she read uh, the mother's arias, the text. And so we recorded her in her beautiful Scottish accent. Um, and uh, and then we nuanced that a little bit more. And I remember at the first draft of the libretto, Missy said, um, you've got to cut some of the, the I love you lines. So there were just too many like of these florid uh, romantic lines. And so I had to strip a few of those away. And it all it's really like sculpting. You, I, I put a marble slab or, or some sort of, uh, I don't know, clay. And then I strip some of that away and then through conversations with, with Missy a little bit more. And then the, the piece starts to really take form. And then Missy adds the music. And that's when the libretto takes a whole other shape because all of a sudden the music will dictate that there needs, there wants to be an aria here. Or um, you've written two arias in a row and we need to sort of get rid of one or, or whatever that would be. So it's like the, the music sort of reveals how the opera wants to function. Uh, and so I'm on call during that process. Um, Missy is currently writing uh, um, Lincoln in the Bardo, an adaptation of George Saunders' novel with me for the Metropolitan Opera. Um, and we're currently in the middle of this process where um, it's like, oh, I need a line here. Or um, I, I, you've said that there are, are six of these Mary Todd characters, but I really want five. And, and, like, and so music dictates that. And we sort of make adjustments so that the, the opera can find its optimal form. Um, so that's basically, um, I, I don't, I, I don't get up terribly early to answer you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I don't have a word count every day. And I, I, you don't have a note count, I don't think, every day. No. Yeah. But you, you know, you have deadlines and deadlines are, are so important. Uh, and so that sort of keeps us on track. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, Royce, once we have that sort of finished libretto, um, uh, again, we're on, I'm in touch with him. We live a mile away from each other in Brooklyn. So um, we're constantly in touch and constantly seeing each other all the time and constantly talking about our work. Um, and then I'll, I'll go, it takes me about um, a year to two years to write that first draft of the opera, which is usually a version that is for piano and voice, as you just heard. And then um, we'll have a workshop, we'll hear that, we'll revise it, revise it, revise it. And then every six months until the premiere, there's another deadline. So orchestra version of act one, orchestra version of act two. So it's like one, once you're sort of done the initial draft, then it's like rapid fire, even though these operas take forever to write. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a very sort of like tense process for me. I have, I have two questions to follow up and then we'll ask Sydney a few questions. Um, first, is it often the case that librettists and composers have such a close and kind of singular relationship? Definitely not. <laughs> no, we're a little weird in that way. <laughs> Um, and we're best friends, right? Okay. <laughs> You're my best friend. Um, and, um, you know, but I think that that is one of the keys to our success. I mean, we're working on our fifth opera now, and then we're pitching our sixth and seventh operas. Um, and this has all happened in the last 10 years. And um, we can be totally honest with each other. We can, like, there's no sort of preciousness about the work. If it's, if it's not working for the good of the piece as a whole, it needs to go away or it needs to be moved somewhere else, like this one idea. Um, so we're very free and I feel free to um, ask Royce to change things. He feels free to ask me to change things or suggest things. Um, and it's just a totally open dialogue. And I know that there's some librettists who are very precious about every word and I've never seen that work well you know if the music isn't doesn't allow the text to change and morph and it, if it doesn't become sort of one animal along with the drama music text drama together then it, it usually falls flat so there's a kind of porousness an ongoing porousness and, and shape and how does and then to, to bring Sydney in how does that possibly change or how do you fine tune it to use your metaphor of, of sculpting how does that then change a little bit more once people start to sing it on stage in rehearsal maybe you can talk about your experience performing some of these pieces and this piece and and how those changes take place I was just sitting here as they were talking about this and and trying to come up with like another example of the creative process where two people have to be so in sync um, you know, to really for the, not just like director, script writer, you know, screenplay writer or whatever, but really like creating one thing like so tandemly, which is, is kind of, I'd never really considered that. But um, yeah, I think what's amazing for me about stuff like this is is being able, first of all, to have the direct contact with the composer, because so often in opera, we're, we're dealing with material of composers who are past. 
Um, and especially with these two, because they've been so present in the experience and, and being able to get to know them and then understand their work a little bit better. And, and the other thing that's kind of amazing, I think, and I'd be curious to hear what they think about it, it's just that, you know, I'm not the first soprano to sing this role. Um, Kiri Duffy created it. And there will be other sopranos who will sing it as well. And so it's um, it's not a one size fit all, fits all, but everyone gets to sort of digest it through their own voice, their own instrument, both acting and singing. And um, I think that's what's exciting about any kind of performance art is that, you know, the interpretation is, is a part of it. It's the lens, but um, to be able to work directly with the creator is really the joy of doing contemporary opera for me personally. And so what is the particularity that you bring to, to it. <laughs> I don't know if I can say. <laughs> I'm she brings this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, I think uh, like like anything, I just try to really look at what's what's on the page. Obviously, I watch the film and and um, the the acting part of opera is something that has always been very close to me and and part of why I came into this. Um, so I love doing things that are like adapted from films and stuff like that, where you get to watch, you know, a a theater performer, a, a movie actor's performance of the piece, um, because you're not just thinking about Violetta and how it's been performed by a million sopranos, you know, really looking at a piece of theater first and then saying, how can we do this on an operatic scale? So that's been kind of my process with this particular work, I think, anyway. Would you like to add anything? Um, when I saw the film, I was dazzled by Emily Watson's performance. It just, it completely shook. I was like, how can a human render these emotions so completely and fully and just force my my heart into all these different directions? And it was her first film. And maybe she was lucky that it was her first film because she didn't have the, the pretense to, to sort of hold her back. Um, but I knew when I when I proposed this to Missy that if we did this opera correctly, that we could offer a singer the opportunity to give that titanic performance that Emily Watson sort of gave the prototype for, but we wanted to create our own animal, our own beast. And then with each director, um, they come and bring their own ideas. And so it's really, this best is truly a collaboration between the, the document, the, the manuscript that Missy and I create, um, and then Tom Morris, who is just an absolute theatrical genius. And it, through conversations with him, uh, I think that we have sculpted this this particular best, uh, and it's really and it's ongoing too. Yeah, we're finding it, it, now in Paris we're having a you know more time to continue to to mold it, like you were saying with the clay and yeah. What's changing now? <laughs> well, what you guys say? <laughs> um, well, we're we just made like in the la like half an hour ago made like some small cuts, and then we added some measures in another place just to based on this like a more organic staging which is great. You know, it's, it's what the, again, the music needs to bend to fit the drama worthy to bend to fit the music. It's like all kind of one animal. Um, yeah. And you were suggesting new choreography, which I loved. And like, it's, we have this, this rule when we're making work that the best idea in the room wins and doesn't matter where it comes from. It could be someone literally walking by the theater. <laughs> it's like, we should do this. Um, but you know, if it's a, a singer, a costume designer, like just everyone needs to comment on the whole. And I think we've finally really achieved that in Paris, and we didn't really have time to do that when we did it in Edinburgh, and certainly not in any of the other productions. So, so this is a real gift. I'm curious, who's actually seen the film? Can you raise your hand if you have seen it? Okay, um, yeah, I hadn't seen it, so I, I didn't know. Um, the other thing that you said that I wanted to ask you about to, to uh, represent the non-opera specialist, uh, or non-opera um, informed member of the general public, you talked about arias and you said that, so I guess the first question would be, what is an aria? An aria is essentially a song. It's an operatic solo. And why, and then you said, and I was struck with this, it was almost like the arias jumped out at certain moments. And then you said, oh, we don't want to have two arias back to back. When does an aria emerge? And does it emerge kind of spontaneously? And can arias be controlled and tamed? Ooh. Sometimes you don't want them to be tamed. Uh, they're sort of ferocious uh, benchmarks in a piece. And so His Name is Yawn was the first piece of music that we composed. And we did it for a 21st century Lederabend in New York City um, back in like 2013, maybe. Uh, and so we wrote this discreet song 
Uh, and it, I knew how I, I wanted the show to open. It just, it like, it, I, I don't know if, I don't remember thinking like, I don't know, 15 years ago that, oh, I'm gonna write this opera and it's gonna start with this, this way. But I remember sitting down and just knowing intuitively how I wanted the show to begin. And it was sort of best standing downstage, sort of breaking the fourth wall, seemingly appealing to the audience. And then all of a sudden you realize that no, there are all these men behind her and she's actually appealing to these men of the church. Um, and yeah, there was that theatrical surprise or that theatrical shift that I was really excited to explore. Um, and then we did a reading of the libretto, for instance, and I, um, one of our producers, Beth Morrison, um, she was like, oh, there's something missing here. Uh, and so I remember going, we had, uh, it was a two day reading and we read the script one day and then I, I went to my hotel room and got to work on it. And then we re re read the script again the next day and I wrote a new aria, uh, Your Body is a Map. Um, and so that was something that emerged that night. I knew that I had to, I wanted to address an issue that one of the producers um, had had brought up. And so I offered this idea and it's one of my favorite moments. It was one of those things that, that truly emerged um, out of thin air, basically. Um, but it was also informed by our trip to Sky. Um, for in that aria, she talks, she looks at Jan's body and she she sort of says, oh, you're your chest, I can trace the the trails and here is a, a lock and here your rib is a, a lake or, or you've got all these different um, sort of scenic elements of Scotland. Um, and so uh, it did, it was informed by um, by this amazing trip and this book that I picked up in Scotland um, called Tramping Through Sky. And I was like, oh, there's something really cool about these people back, you know, centuries ago who blazed trails in this wilderness and and the mountains and the locks and the the meadows and and the sheep um <laughs> and that sort of thing and so yeah sometimes arias really do just emerge and sometimes you do have to sort of fight for them and, and figure out how you're going to honor having a star mezzo soprano uh, and give her a moment to uh to really shine in act two and so you're like okay how do i facilitate that um and so you're you're librettist job is to come up with text yes but also to create the scaffolding with which the music will hang on you mentioned you've mentioned several times this trip to the sky and for you musically missy it was important because there was the gaelic tradition of music that you also encountered can you talk about how the trip influenced your music in writing? yes um well i mentioned this overture of, that was inspired by the landscape which is a very rare thing for me i mean a lot of composers are very influenced by nature and i am not <laughs> Sounds crazy. I, but I'm very influenced by people, a human drama, the way that people work together, work against each other, um, and just daily human drama to big human drama has always been the thing that's motivated my work, even my instrumental work. But I was so struck by this natural landscape that I knew that that had to be in the piece. Um, and then through my research um, that started while we were there, I discovered um, this Gaelic, this tradition from the Scottish Highlands called Gaelic Psalms. Um, and I'm not an expert on Gaelic Psalms, but from my ear, it sounded like, um, you know, there's a minister in a, in a church who will sing a phrase and then the congregation would sing it back to the minister, um, but not lining up together. So it wasn't like a choir all starting and stopping at the same time. It was, um, the idea was that it was a communication between you and God. And it didn't matter if you were in harmony or in sync with the person next to you. So sonically, the result is this like crazy warbly mass where everyone's kind of singing the same thing, but it's slightly different times. And there's a moment in the opera where I did my own version of that, where the the councilmen are in church and they're all kind of singing out of sync for a second. That's fascinating. <laughs> I'm mesmerized by this description. Um, Sydney, on our call, you talked about how you were interpreting um, the, the question of religion in the opera as one of a much more personal relationship of faith. Can you talk about your um, point of view on this question of religion playing Bess? Yeah, I remember when I um, was first sort of offered the potential to do the part, and so I and I hadn't seen the film, and so I went online and I watched a bit. And the moment she started talking to God, I was like, Yeah, I want to do this project. <laughs> Because this idea that you, and she doesn't just talk to God, she talks as God. So she speaks to God and then God speaks through her very directly. So she'll say like, oh, dear, you know, dear God, thank you so much. And then she'll say, Bess, you know, you need to do this and that. And I loved that idea of um, 
her faith being so strong that it sort of physically came through her and that she did couldn't really separate herself from it in a way um and yeah for for me what, the thing that I just can't escape in this piece and and when I do it I feel very very close to is this idea of faith and the and that when it's when someone is holds so tightly to faith and belief to the point where it becomes dangerous and that's what this journey feels like to me like this very dangerous skating this line of faith belief that keeps her strong that keeps her focused towards her goal and keeps her um uh keeps her in her in her quest for this love to to justify this love and to to make it um to make it work but that she actually tips into the faith just sort of helping her justify some actions that are questionable. And, um, you know, as a performer, I have to sort of just believe and and be fully on the side of, of belief and faith. But when I watched it as an audience member, the whole time I'm thinking, well, what's coming first? You know, is it is this about God or is this actually about justifying these actions that because of this impossible scenario? So uh, this is, I mean, I think this is a really good moment to pause. I'm looking at the time and we will turn to your audience questions um, to think about. So you mentioned that it's been about eight years that you've been doing this um, or thinking about it. That the well, we premiered it in 16, but we have been working on it since uh, we went to the Isle of Skye in 2014. Okay. Yeah. So I and I had a draft written then. So it was 2013. So it's been 10 years, 10 years. at Thank least you. that Thank we have been thinking about this. <laughs> at least. And for you, I mean, it's been a lifetime with yes. the story. <laughs> so, um, and I think what's so and we were talking about this, too, how if art is a mirror that holds up uh, if art is um, yeah, a mirror that holds up a kind of reflection to society, society has changed, I mean, to this point about dogma, changed so rapidly um, over the last decade, especially, you know, we talked about how this is raising questions about what is it to be a woman, what does it be to be a liberated woman. Can you talk about how um, the, the opera has changed in response to a kind of changing society as well? Yeah, well, it's interesting because in a lot of ways, I feel like without us doing anything, the, the story of the opera has become even more relevant in the last 10 years and certainly in the six or so years since Me Too, um, which at least in America was a real dividing line in the conversation and in the kinds of conversations that it was even possible to have um, as a woman. And um, I think that, you know, I hold that, you know, best best a story, as I mentioned, is one of a woman in an impossible situation. And I think we're just all these stories of women in impossible situations are coming to light in a way like never before and continue to do so. Um, but I also there's a Picasso quote that I love that art is a lie that tells the truth. And Bess is going through a very extreme fictional <laughs> version of this um, struggle that I think a lot of women, myself included, go through every day. So, no, you know, it's fiction. No one is going through, um, we're not, we didn't actually, we don't actually like hurt Sydney. <laughs> you know? um, no sopranos were harmed in the making of this opera. Um, you know, but I think going to that extreme is required to get the message across. And it's also just, um, that is the kind of work that I'm interested in making. Um, you know, uh, it was about five years ago that people stopped asking me to write children's operas. <laughs> And family operas, it's just not my style. I tend towards the darker side of life. And as I said before, I'm really interested in art that leaves us with more questions and answers. Um, so that's one of the millions of ways to answer that that question. Would you like to add anything? Um, I, I'm fascinated by the the aria at the top of Act 3. And I, I knew that we were potentially um, delving into something important, um, but it's become even more um, just uh, really vivid and, and important and important. Um, and it's, uh, she says, uh, she sort of reprises this idea of from the aria that I was talking about the map of Jan's body. Um, and she talks about how it's my body. And you know that she is making choices for herself and her body. And right now in especially in America, we are dealing with some major conversations about the the lack of agency with women and their bodies, and and um, and so I every time I hear this, I, I just I think that that's I, I think that we hopefully got that moment right, and it, yeah, and that has really changed from the premiere in two thousand sixteen, um, and you know, hearing that even in rehearsal the other day, I was like, oh yes, you know, I'm hearing it completely differently, even as the author. And Sydney, you were saying too how coming to this role after having not performed for a while was also striking. And in, in other words, that this 
um, ongoing performances of this were punctuated by the pandemic and, and lockdowns. Can you talk about maybe the personal experience of this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, culturally we shift and we change and when we come, it's interesting as, an, as a performer or an artist to come back to a piece you've done before with, with new perspective and I definitely have different feelings about it this time but, you know, some of the things remain the same for me, this idea of this person who gets outcast by their community because they're not doing things that are accepted and that's a theme that I think you know we all know see that every day and somehow we as people are struggling to get over that hurdle to just accept people and to love them even when it's hard to love them and so um that's that's sort of been consistent you know before and after the pandemic but yeah I mean it's it, it like the body my body as a map definitely has a, a slightly different resonance now which is also great that you know that's why it's so wonderful when these contemporary operas get to have many, many performances, which isn't always the case because you get different audiences and you also get to see how it resonates over different periods of time. Okay, let's have a big final round of applause, please. Thank you so much. No, we have audience questions. So now we'll open up to your questions and I will pass the mic to Alphonse. Hi guys. Hey, Royce. <laughs> Would you ever write a libretto or a song cycle without having found the composer for the music? No. You'd you'd have to have you'd have to know who that is. I'm 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 sure that there are younger people that I, I think that that might be a, a really if, if you're starting out I would say please find a composer collaborator that you can be you know, come up with the idea that you want to tell together. But I think that's a really tricky thing to sort of impose a, a, or like to create something that you don't have that person who has already bought into the experience and at this stage of my career most of our work at this at this stage of our careers um our work is mostly commissioned it, entirely commissioned and so um we know where it's going to premiere and i think that that's that's pretty important otherwise you you spend years writing something that you just don't know if you're going to have a producer and often you have to self-produce and that's a great way to start we started self-producing our work um you were actually in one of the first concerts that i did that i self-produced <laughs> um so it's a it's a really wonderful tool and um nobody is going to give you a commission if you don't have something to show for it so it's sort of a chicken and the egg sort of thing um but yeah there's no there's no hard and fast rule, but I I would not do that. This is Andrew Nolan. He's in our cast. He plays the um, the stern councilman, but as you can see, he's actually a very nice guy. <laughs> we don't bite. How uh, how do you choose? I guess this is a question for more Missy, but I'm sure Royce here in on the conversation. Um, how do you choose what voice type to uh, make a character, right? Like, does that have more to do with who you know you're going to hire for the show or does that have to do more with... You just always write a part for a light, soprano, light high soprano, always. Well, now, since we met Sydney, we will. Um, there, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, first of all, you're thinking of the character. So, um, you know, what if this opera's weird, everyone's singing their thoughts, you know, so the, this person's thoughts, what what do they sound like? And it might not be what their actual voice sounds like. Um, we, um, you know, we, you could have a very nasty villainous character and, and set it as like a very beautiful tenor, you know, this very high voice, which isn't exactly what I would think of. Um, and the opposite too. So, um, and then it's a balance of voices in a show. So you don't want all sopranos or all mezzo sopranos. Um, you want a healthy mix. Um, it just, it's just easier to get things performed and it's easier to write when you have different voices that work well in different ranges. Um, and then uh, third thing is, yeah, writing for our friends. Um, you know, often we, I always write with actual people in mind. Um, and so uh, sometimes we will create a character and maybe originally it's a soprano and then it's, oh, it's, we want this person to sing. It, it has to be a, a, like a very low mezzo or something or the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, bring it. 
You know, I've been in the business for a while, but it never occurred to me that one could have a reading for a libretto. So what's that like? Is Do you guys gather around to like, do you assign roles and, and read through it? There are a, quite a few librettists who like to have sort of, in, in the same way that a, a theatrical reading would happen. And I'm not sure if everybody is uh, um, familiar with what, um, so music stands, you have the script in front of you and you say the line, you cast different characters and you say the lines and um, and you get to hear the words aloud. And, and usually you work for about five days in that context and and then you have a, a presentation at the end. In opera, I find it to be not that useful for me. Um, there are other librettists, again, who find this immensely useful. Um, but my reading process generally is sitting around a table where I read the script aloud to the leaders who are the producers who are involved. Um, and Missy will be there and who, and the dramaturg will be there. Um, but that, uh, I, don't, I don't need to hear eight actors and work with eight actors to finesse something because Missy controls time and um, just uh, and the nuances of how things are set. She gets to dictate how the pitches and the the rhythm. So it just it seems to me uh, that the best use of money, and it's, it does come down to money too, that I think that you should put that money towards a piano vocal reading. And so that we can hear how the words sound with piano and voice, and then make adjustments based on how Missy has chosen to set the phrases that I that I write. Um, but many, many, many companies and librettists do use libretto readings, and it can be a five day process. It can be two days. It can be um, people on their feet doing theater games and trying to devise things. It, it can take any shape, um, depending on what kind of librettist you are. Um, but I, I like to sit at a table and read all the parts because you can. And also, it's really nice to hear a composer as well. I love going to Missy's house where she will sing the the words and we'll, I'll hear the MIDI files. And that's the first way that we communicate the way that things are set. And it's so in, in some ways, that's kind of a, a, a reading, a, a private reading that I, I get. And it, it's amazing. So first of all, thank you so much to all of you. This is absolutely incredible. It's like, I always like to hear the backstory and this is like a perfect backstory. But so what I'm wondering is so much of this depends on your collaboration. Missy, how did you get to this point to start writing opera? And how did you guys meet? And how did this happen? So this is a silly question. <laughs> yeah, the tr the real backstory. Um, I mean, I have been a composer almost my entire life. I started writing very young when I was about ten, and um, I knew I wanted to be a musician. I was not. I was. A, I'm a pianist, but I'm not a. a I'm not really a great pianist who's going to do soul recitals of Beethoven. And um, I wanted something creative that would allow me to access all art forms, and like opera is the ultimate manifestation of that. Um, and, but I still didn't think that I, I wasn't really interested in opera um, until I was in my late twenties. Um, just because opera, at, you know, 15 years ago, at least in America, it was a, a very different being. There weren't as many contemporary operas. There weren't a lot of independent producers. I mean, you were either writing for the Met and you were writing these massive works with full chorus and orchestra, or you weren't doing it at all. Um, there was nothing that sort of exists that I knew that existed sort of in the, the middle ground like this does. Um, so I'd written, uh, I'd started to write an opera, um, our, which ended up becoming our first opera called Song from the Uproar, which is um, a sort of a retelling of the life, um, or based on the life and writings of Isabel Eberhardt, who was a Swiss explorer who went to North Africa by herself in um, the very early 20th century, in late 19th century, and dressed as a man and led this very independent operatic life. Um, so we did a piece based on her journals. Um, and I had started it myself because I didn't know any librettists and I'd written about 25% of it and I was really stuck. I didn't know how to create something that lasted an evening. That's a whole different skill. And then I went to Carnegie Hall one night to um, so actually support a friend of mine, a, friend, a mutual friend, David T. Little, great composer. Royce had written the libretto for um, 
uh, their opera Dog Days and they were performing a snippet of it at Carnegie Hall. And I just heard it and I was like, who wrote these words? This is crazy. It's really, it's a crazy, wild, wonderful piece. And, um, and I went up to him afterwards and I gave him a flyer because I was presenting like this little chunk of my little opera that I was doing. And I, I asked if he would come and I thought he didn't like me at first, but that's just me. That's just me. He's, he remembers it differently. And then we had lunch a week later and the rest is history. And then every, every opera since then, we've been hired as a team to, to write it together. That was a really great event at Galapagos Art Space as well. <laughs> it was a pleasure to be there. Um, I was struck by something that Sydney said earlier about how it's it's rare to be working in an opera with um with composers and librettists that are still alive. Um, because I think opera is something we all have an image of it as something quite antiquated, old, um, belonging to not a past age, but history at least. So how is opera changing now? And what does the future of contemporary opera look like faced with the modern world? Okay, we need to lock the doors and uh, and expand this evening to another two hours. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, fabulous, amazing question. And it's like an existential question for us because we we only write contemporary operas and we are contributing to this thing that can sort of seem like a museum. Um, and it, opera needs to have new works in order to exist, I think, to, to keep pushing the form or else we're just, it's going to become dusty and it's just going to go away. Um, and I struggle because I come from a family of farmers in Northern Canada. And my brother, for instance, has not ever seen an opera. Um, not that he doesn't like opera per se, but he listens to rock and roll music and country music and it's not his language. And so I keep thinking like, I want to write operas that my brother is going to like want to see that he's not going to like sit in the audience and shuffle his feet all the time and, and not want to be there. I want to delight even people like my brother, who's like just a normal farmer type of dude who works in environmental sciences now and um, He's, he's a, a really great guy, but it's just not for him. So, um, but it will be for him. I want to create the operas that will be for him. And so I think that it's our duty to tell stories that sort of galvanize or, or just ignite the imaginations of a contemporary public. And in many ways, I've been reflecting on the idea that what we do is sort of write folk operas. We are writing operas for the people. And when I wanted to, when I first sort of... Uh, got a glimpse of opera through my childhood singing teacher, um, there was something about the Metropolitan Opera, those massive chandeliers, and the dresses, and just thinking, oh, it's the most, it's the antithesis of my upbringing. And I wanted that so bad. I wanted to transcend a farm, and I wanted, I wanted the Prada shoes, and... <laughs> and the $4,000 suits, and um, I wanted to come to Paris to go to a beautiful tailor and all these things. Um, and now it's everything that I don't want for opera. I want opera to be for absolutely everyone. Um, and there was some sort of statistic that when we premiered uh, Breaking the Waves in Philadelphia, um, that a, a huge percentage of the tickets that were sold were first time opera goers. So something about Breaking the Waves sort of cracked open um, that and allowed for these people who didn't feel welcome or um, or who just didn't even consider opera to come and and see our shows and experience our stories. And I think that my brother is not going to go to the magic flute and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> this speaks to me in a really direct way. And ah, oh. but he is going to come and see Dog Days and he will see my opera Angel's Bone. He will see Breaking the Waves. He will come to see Lincoln in the Bardo. And those stories communicate way more directly, I think. Um, and that's what I want to contribute. If you feel like you want to write a new Oedipus Rex opera, please do it. If that's what's in your heart, go for it. Um, I want to tell contemporary stories that, that um, feel like they do hold a mirror up to our contemporary experience, that what we, like, we are all in a room together. Um, and I think I, I, we are inundated by stories whether it's a, a three minute song on the radio or whether it's a, a book that we're reading from this beautiful library or what have you. I think that we, we love stories and we, I, I think that it's, it's important that we, that we leave, that our legacy is, is contributing something that feels like it could only be written right now. 
and that's what I, Missy's yeah <laughs> and and Missy's language is is such that it yes it comes from a, a classical music tradition but it feels like what she does is, is her prism is so contemporary and like it's only hers like it's it's really really exciting I'm I'm obsessed with <laughs> with my best friend <laughs> And I would just add that I, I came to opera initially through music videos, you know, so as a kid, I did not grow up in a musical household. I took piano lessons, but that was the only sort of culture. I grew up in small town, Pennsylvania, um, in a sort of isolated part of Pennsylvania. And um, I watched MTV like four hours a day. <laughs> and this was back in like the late 80s when they were still just showing videos on MTV. And I thought, this is the ultimate art form. And so I came to it through then. And then I was like, I'm studying music. Oh, like my version of that is an opera. Um, and so it always, I, I also kind of, I don't like the elitist side of opera. I love getting dressed up just like anybody else, but like, I don't like when people feel that that's a, a, a deterrent because I'm like, oh, this is just a massive music video. You know, I just wanted to do the biggest, craziest thing I could do in my art form and use all my friends. So I think if you go into it thinking of it that way, then it, it can be much more approachable. Yeah, I would say like, it's been also really cool to see the way that this rise in contemporary opera in America, especially, because I think there really is a bit of a renaissance going on, is starting to affect the way people are also staging the traditional pieces. And so it's having a ricochet and because we should, we can't leave them behind. They're a huge part of, you know, the, 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 you know, what brought us to this point. And it's really pushing people to look at these these older pieces in new ways and to bring, try to make them feel more relevant as well and bring new light to them and be a little bit, you know, rebellious with how we stage them. I even know directors who are starting to sort of like cut out this bit and add in a contemporary piece here. And, and it, so it's been really cool. It's a little bit of a I think it's a rebellious time in our art form, and I think it's a time that people are starting to sort of throw away a lot of the things that have kept it chained to this museum piece of the past. And so it's an, it feels like an exciting time to be in this genre of music. Well, and also, I'm not sure if, if any of you or all of you read the amazing article in the New York Times recently where Peter Gelb um, sort of said that, that the, the classic stuff isn't selling at the Met anymore, and he's committed to doing three or four contemporary pieces a year, which is insane and so exciting. And they're selling out. Oh my God, Fires Up On My Bones was such a success that they're bringing it back. The Hours was such a huge success. They're bringing it back. The Hours um, was on the top box office list when it went into the Met in HD. So it was like the ninth highest grossing movie in the entire country that week which is, it's so exciting. So it's just it, where all of a sudden post COVID, um, there is a huge shift in the priority of new works at the Metropolitan Opera, which was not something that I would have ever imagined in my wildest dreams, so. Like speaking in Paris. <laughs> like speaking in Paris. 